In the Inuit language of cold, wintry Alaska, there are dozens of words for snow. Dozens of words with intricacies and connotations well known and understood by them, but typically unnoticed and misunderstood by others. Similarly, in the Sanskrit language of ancient spiritual India, there are approximately a dozen different words for consciousness. A dozen clearly delineated words with subtle nuances, which in English we can only loosely, clumsily call consciousness. A. K. Kumaraswamy wrote, For every psychological term in English, there are four in Greek and forty in Sanskrit. So what exactly is consciousness? When Western doctors say someone is conscious or unconscious, they really just mean awake or asleep. The patient is called unconscious under anesthetics and conscious when awakened. However, this particular meaning is clearly a misnomer because even when supposedly unconscious during sleep, coma, or under anesthetics, we still dream and are conscious of that experience, so our consciousness hasn't disappeared as implied, it is merely altered or shifted to another state. Dr. David Hawkins wrote, In medicine, the presumption that consciousness is nothing more than a function of the brain is reflected in such statements as, The patient regained consciousness. This routine, narrow depiction has assumed that consciousness is a mundane physical phenomenon, a self-evident priority for experience about which nothing more needs to be said. Other common misuses of the word consciousness are awareness, as in being conscious of something, and spirituality, as in attaining higher consciousness. But again, these are not the denotations understood by modern scientists or ancient mystics. As best expressed by theoretical physicist and experimental psychologist Peter Russell, the true, simple meaning of consciousness is the capacity for experience. Consciousness is the ability to have an inner experience. It is our internal world of thoughts, emotions, sensations, perceptions, and choices. The I, the little me in our minds, the sense of self inside us that has never changed since childhood. That is consciousness. Dr. David Hawkins wrote, The identification and experience of self could be limited to a description of one's physical body. Then, of course, we might well ask, how does one know that one has a physical body? Through observation, we note that the presence of the physical body is registered by the senses. The question then follows, what is it that's aware of the senses? How do we experience what the senses are reporting? Something greater, something more encompassing than the physical body, has to exist in order to experience that which is lesser, and that something is the mind. The question then arises, how does one know what's being experienced by the mind? By observation and introspection, one can witness that thoughts have no capacity to experience themselves, but that something both beyond and more basic than thought experiences the sequence of thoughts, and that that something's sense of identity is unaltered by the content of thoughts. That something is consciousness, the capacity for experience the inner witness of our outer lives. As written by philosopher Malcolm Hollick, events are experienced by an experiencer. Thoughts are thought by a thinker. Pain is felt by a feeler. Imaginings are created by an imaginer. And choices are made by a chooser. Dr. David Hawkins wrote, what is it that observes and is aware of all the subjective and objective phenomena of life? It's consciousness itself that resonates as both awareness and experiencing, and both are purely subjective. Consciousness isn't determined by content. Thoughts flowing through consciousness are like fish swimming in the ocean. The ocean's existence is independent of the fish. The content of the sea doesn't define the nature of the water itself. Given the definition, the capacity for inner experience, 
we can easily observe that consciousness is not a phenomenon limited to only human beings. In fact, as we trace the trade of consciousness back through the animal kingdom, it becomes increasingly difficult to say there exists any animal which doesn't have its own inner experience of the outer world. In his excellent book, From Science to God, Peter Russell examines this issue in detail, starting with the example of a dog. A dog may not be aware of all the things of which we are aware. It does not think or reason as humans do, and it probably does not have the same degree of self-awareness. But this does not mean that a dog does not have its own inner world of experience. When I am with a dog, I assume that it has its own mental picture of the world, full of sounds, colors, smells, and sensations. It appears to recognize people and places, much as we might. A dog may at times show fear, and at other times excitement. Asleep it can appear to dream, feet and toes twitching as if on the scent of some fantasy rabbit. And when a dog yelps or whines, we assume it is feeling pain. Indeed, if we didn't believe that dogs felt pain, we wouldn't bother giving them anesthetics before an operation. My dog Buddy always recognizes me and shows excitement when I come through the door. He also recognizes the veterinarian's office and shows fear when we pull into the parking lot. If I ignore Buddy and give more attention to his sister, Harley, then Buddy will exhibit signs of feeling slighted and jealous. He will sulk by himself in the corner of the room, his tail no longer wagging when I go to pet him. If I raise my voice at him, he will cower, lower his head, and scamper off. From facial recognition, to dreams, to complex emotions, dogs exhibit a multitude of expressions associated with consciousness. To assume they exhibit all these external characteristics of consciousness without having their own internal experience is quite implausible. And as Peter Russell points out, if we actually believed that dogs didn't feel pain, we wouldn't give them anesthetics before an operation. If dogs possess consciousness, then so do cats, horses, deer, dolphins, whales, and other mammals. They may not be self-conscious as we are, but they are not devoid of inner experience. The same is true of birds. Some parrots, for example, seem as aware as dogs. And if birds are sentient beings, then so, I assume, are other vertebrates, alligators, snakes, frogs, salmon, and sharks. However different their experiences may be, they all share the faculty of consciousness. The same argument applies to creatures further down the evolutionary tree. The nervous systems of insects are not nearly as complex as ours, and insects probably do not have as rich an experience of the world as we do. But I see no reason to doubt that they have some kind of inner experience. Where do we draw the line? Carefully considering where to draw the line between conscious and non-conscious entities, the closer one examines the issue, the more difficult it becomes to argue that any animal is insentient. Regardless of whether they have a brain or nervous system, no matter how small or simple, all animals seem to have their own inner experience and exhibit common characteristics of consciousness. So what about the plant kingdom? While most would agree that animals are conscious, most would probably agree that plants are not. Is this where we can draw the line? Apparently not. Thanks to the work of Cleve Baxter, Dr. Ken Hashimoto, and others, it is clear that even plants are remarkably conscious. In 1966, polygraph expert Cleve Baxter conducted a series of experiments which conclusively demonstrated that plants are capable of intelligent thought processes. First, he took a dracaena plant, a dragon tree, in his office and connected lie detection equipment to its leaves. Next, he watered the plant and found that its polygraph output was similar to the undulation of human happiness. In order to test his developing theory and elicit a stronger reaction, Baxter thought to threaten the plant by burning one of its leaves. With this thought in mind, even before retrieving a match, he noticed a strong positive curve appear on the polygraph paper. He then left the room to find some matches, and as soon as he arrived back, another high peak appeared on the paper. As he lit a match, the plant's fear reaction spiked and remained high as he proceeded to burn one of its leaves. In further trials, Baxter found that if he showed less inclination to burn the plant, 
its reaction was weaker, and if he merely pretended to burn it, there was no reaction. So not only was the plant appearing to show genuine happiness and fear, but it seemed to be discerning true intentions from false ones. Irvin Laszlo wrote, In 1966, Cleve Baxter, a pioneer of lie detection methods, decided to threaten a dragon plant in his office. A few minutes before, and having on a whim connected the plant to the electrodes of one of his lie detectors, he had noticed that when he watered its roots, the plant gave what in a human being would be interpreted as an emotional reaction. To arouse the strongest reaction he could, Baxter first placed a leaf of the plant in hot coffee, with no apparent response. He then decided on a worse threat, to burn the leaf. But as soon as he thought about the flame, there was an instant response from the plant. Without Baxter moving but just thinking about the threat, the plant had reacted. When he left the room and returned with some matches, there was a second surge of anticipation from the plant. And as he reluctantly burned the leaf, there was a subdued but still noticeable reaction from the dragon plant. Over the next forty years, Baxter ran a large series of experiments, building up a huge archive of data showing that all organisms are in continual communication in a vast matrix of dynamic and non-local awareness. In further trials, Baxter tried burning the leaves of other nearby plants not connected to the polygraph, and the original dragon plant, still connected, registered the same wild response to its friend's pain as when its own leaves were burned. In another experiment, Baxter placed two plants in an empty room, blindfolded six students, and had them draw straws. The receiver of the short straw was then secretly instructed to uproot and destroy one of the two plants. Since they were all blindfolded, only the short straw student and the remaining plant knew the identity of the murderer. Two hours later, Baxter connected the remaining plant to the polygraph machine and instructed each student to walk past it. The murder witness plant registered absolutely no reaction as the five innocent students walked by, but then went crazy almost off the charts as the murderer came close. Somehow it correctly identified and emotionally reacted to the guilty student. Baxter's experiments suggest that plants are not only conscious, intelligent, and emotional, but also telepathic. Plants will indeed register a typical human fear reaction on the polygraph precisely when someone directs a malevolent thought towards them. These experiments have been replicated many times with the same results. Somehow, plants are able to intuit and react to certain human thought patterns. Lynn McTaggart wrote, The Baxter effect had also been seen between plants and animals. When brine shrimp in one location died suddenly, this fact seemed to instantly register with plants in another location, as recorded on a standard psychogalvanic response, PGR, instrument. Baxter had carried out this type of experiment over several hundred miles, and among paramecium, mold cultures, and blood samples, and in each instance, some mysterious communication occurred between living things and plants. As in Star Wars, each death was registered as a disturbance in the field. Other experiments have been performed testing the effect of prayer, positive and negative directed intention and emotion on plants. Dr. Bernard Grad of McGill University had a team of psychic healers habitually direct positive or negative feelings onto a variety of plants. The positively infused plants survived and thrived, while negatively infused plants withered and many of them died. Reverend Franklin Lohr, a Northampton pastor, performed similar studies with his parishioners, testing the power of prayer to affect plants and seeds. In one experiment, he planted 46 corn kernels evenly spaced in a round pan with 23 on each side. He then gave daily positive growth prayer to half of the kernels and anti-growth prayer to the other half. Eight days later, the positive side had 16 sturdy budding seedlings growing, and the negative side had only one barely left alive. In another test, one of his parishioners, Erwin Proust, subjected six ivy plants to daily anti-growth prayer while watering them, and within five weeks, five of them were dead. In the incredible documentary The Secret Life of Plants, Fuji Electronics Managing Director and Chief of Research Dr. Ken Hashimoto 
created special instruments which translate the electrical output of plants into modulated sounds, effectively giving them a voice. His wife has since been teaching the Japanese alphabet to her favorite plants. In the documentary, Mrs. Hashimoto recites Japanese letters, phonemes, words, and the plants repeat them back to her. Reminiscent of a small child trying to sound out new words, the plants are unable to properly imitate the language at first, but then actually struggle and practice, slowly improving until they are able to perfectly imitate the human sounds via their electrical output. So if plants can learn languages, show emotional output, react to emotional and intellectual stimulus, communicate with other plants, and read the minds and intentions of humans, it is quite rational to assume that the plant kingdom, just like the animal kingdom, is conscious. Adrian Cooper wrote, This demonstrates extremely well that plant life, like all life, and indeed everything in the universe, are an inseparable aspect of the same infinite mind, consciousness, and intelligence of the source, the first cause, of God. Human beings, still totally steeped in the material world and personal ego, assume that just because a plant does not appear to have a physical brain, or a mouth, or any other animal characteristics, that they are unintelligent, or simply inanimate. Nothing, in fact, can be further from the truth. The human brain is not the real mind, any more than physical parts of a plant or a mineral are real mind. So how far down the evolutionary line does consciousness exist? The work of Dr. Masaru Emoto suggests that even water is in some sense conscious. His research began by exposing H2O to non-physical stimulus and photographing the resulting water crystals with a dark field microscope. David Icke wrote, Japanese researcher Masaru Emoto of the IHM Institute in Tokyo has revealed how water is fundamentally affected by words, thoughts, and emotions, all of which are waveforms. He and his team exposed water to various music and different words and expressions, and then froze it to produce water crystals. When these were examined under a microscope, the response of the water was amazing. Look at the way it reacted to the words and thoughts, vibrations, of love and appreciation, and you make me sick. I will kill you. Imagine the effect on the body of our words and deeds when it is some 70% water. This is how thoughts and words affect us energetically. I should stress that it is not the words that have the effect, but the intent behind them. If you said, I will kill you, in a light-hearted fashion, as a bit of fun, it would not have the same effect as it would if you meant it, or said it with malevolence. Thus, even water has the ability to distinguish between real human emotions and fake platitudes. When infused with positive intent, the H2O molecules align themselves into beautiful, symmetric, sacred geometrical forms. And when infused with negative intent, they align themselves into chaotic, non-symmetrical blobs. Obviously, the level and type of consciousness operating in water molecules is far different from human consciousness. But the fact that something in the molecules is identifying and reacting to human emotional and intellectual content suggests that even water is indeed in some sense conscious. Peter Russell wrote, We usually assume that some kind of brain or nervous system is necessary before consciousness can come into being. From the perspective of the materialist meta-paradigm, this is a reasonable assumption. If consciousness arises from processes in the material world, then those processes need to occur somewhere, and the obvious candidate is the nervous system. But then we come up against the inherent problem of the materialist meta-paradigm. Whether we are considering a human brain with its tens of billions of cells, or a nematode worm with a hundred or so neurons, the problem is the same. How can any purely material process ever give rise to consciousness? Can we truly draw a definitive line between conscious and non-conscious entities in the universe? At what level of simplicity do we assume matter to be insentient? Even single-cell organisms react to external stimulus, reproduce, communicate, respirate, hunt, and consume food. Is this all an unconscious, insentient program of Newton's mechanical universe? Or are even single cells imbued with a slight degree of consciousness? a minuscule internal experience of their own. 
When sperm and egg unite, each human begins their life as a single-cell organism, which then rapidly divides and multiplies into the conscious community of 50 trillion cells we generally know as human. In classical science, consciousness is a mysterious emergent property of this process. In the spiritual science, consciousness is the known primary property, and the physical world is the emergent mystery. Peter Russell wrote, The capacity for inner experience could not evolve or emerge out of entirely insentient, non-experiencing matter. Experience can only come from that which already has experience. Therefore, the faculty of consciousness must be present all the way down the evolutionary tree. There is nowhere we can draw a line between conscious and non-conscious entities. There is a trace of sentience, however slight, in viruses, molecules, atoms, and even elementary particles. Some argue this implies that rocks perceive the world around them, perhaps have thoughts and feelings, and enjoy an inner mental life similar to human beings. This is clearly an absurd suggestion, and not one that was ever intended. If a bacterium's experience is a billionth of the richness and intensity of human beings, the degree of experience in the minerals of a rock might be a billion times dimmer still. They would possess none of the qualities of human consciousness, just the faintest possible glimmer of sentience. The ancient Sufi teaching states that God sleeps in the rock, dreams in the plant, stirs in the animal, and awakens in the man. What if we replaced the word God with the one infinite consciousness? If God is defined as an omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent intelligence, then God must exist inside all things, yet outside of all space, time, and matter. What is quantum physics and honest introspection shown exists inside all things, yet outside space, time, and matter. Consciousness. Dr. David Hawkins wrote, Without consciousness, there would be nothing to experience form. It could also be said that form itself, as a product of perception with no independent existence, is thus transitory and limited, whereas consciousness is all-encompassing and unlimited. How could that which is transitory, with a clear beginning and ending, create that which is formless? all-encompassing, and omnipotent. How can non-experiencing, unintelligent, insentient matter randomly coalesce into a form that magically creates conscious, intelligent life? What mechanical process could possibly bring consciousness, intelligence, and life into being? How could any material process create something as immaterial as consciousness? Why would the material universe even exist without a consciousness to perceive it? Quantum physics and Eastern mysticism are both quite clear that matter does not exist without a consciousness to perceive it. Albert Einstein himself said, A human being is a part of the whole, called by us universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings, as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of consciousness. Irvin Laszlo wrote, Whatever our beliefs, irrespective of how far we expand our perception, and regardless of how profound the ability of science may be to understand processes of emergence, sooner or later we arrive at the requirement for an originating creative act. We arrive ultimately at the concept of a cosmic mind. Although science has so far chosen to ignore this inescapable logic, the deeper we delve into the fundamental mysteries of nature, as did Einstein, we see order harmony, and cosmic mind manifest in our universe. What is revealed doesn't require us to choose between intelligent design and evolution, but to recognize a co-creative design for evolution. What we see, literally hidden in full view, is Einstein's concept of a cosmic mind at work. Unless you actually think God is a bearded white man living in the clouds, perhaps replacing that word, as Einstein did, with something like cosmic mind universal being, or infinite consciousness, will help bridge the mental gap most Westerners seem to have between science and spirituality. Roger Stevens wrote, After I shook the dust of organized religion from my sandals, I learned that the link between big old God and little old me was no more and no less than consciousness, 
and each of us, at and as the very center of us, has this same feeling of I am, for the not-so-obvious reason that each one of us is really God pretending to be each one of us. There is only one I am. There is only one God, one Brahma, one Tao, one beingness. We both see the same world, because we both are the same world. But we have so cleverly and convincingly hidden ourselves from ourselves that we really believe that we are separate entities. Lynn McTaggart wrote, The coming scientific revolution heralds the end of dualism in every sense. Far from destroying God, science for the first time is proving his existence by demonstrating that a higher collective consciousness is out there. As shown previously, the plenum of physical forms in the universe is fundamentally an energetic oneness, with consciousness playing the role of creator and experiencer. This means the multitude of transitory material forms and bodies about us don't exist without us, and come from within us. Greg Braden wrote, A growing body of research suggests that we're more than cosmic latecomers simply passing through a universe that was completed long ago. Experimental evidence is leading to a conclusion that we are actually creating the universe as we go, and adding to what already exists. In other words, we appear to be the very energy that's forming the cosmos, as well as the beings who experience what we're creating. That's because we are consciousness, and consciousness appears to be the same stuff from which the universe is made. Dr. David Hawkins wrote, The universe holds its breath as we choose, instant by instant, which pathway to follow. For the universe, the very essence of life itself, is highly conscious. Every act, thought, and choice adds to a permanent mosaic. Our decisions ripple through the universe of consciousness to affect the lives of all. Lest this idea be considered either merely mystical or fanciful, let's remember that fundamental tenet of the new theoretical physics, everything in the universe is connected with everything else. The Tibetan Book of the Great Liberation writes, Matter is derived from mind, not mind from matter. More and more, scientists are catching up with ancient mystics regarding the primacy of consciousness, the fact that consciousness is an a priori facet of reality and not some emergent property of materiality. One of the fathers of modern brain research, Wilder Penfield, wrote The Mystery of Mind, in which he argues his opinion as a neurosurgeon that consciousness does not have its source in the brain. The prestigious Vision 97 award-winning psychiatrist Dr. Stanislav Grof also agrees that consciousness is a primary, non-local phenomenon that precedes and transcends time and space. He wrote, Over three decades of systematic studies of the human consciousness have led me to conclusions that many traditional psychiatrists and psychologists might find implausible, if not downright incredible. I now firmly believe that consciousness is more than an accidental byproduct of the neurophysiological and biochemical processes taking place in the human brain. I see consciousness and the human psyche as expressions and reflections of a cosmic intelligence that permeates the entire universe and all of existence. We are not just highly evolved animals with biological computers embedded inside our skulls. We are also fields of consciousness without limits, transcending time, space, matter, and linear causality. The idea that consciousness mysteriously arises from the nervous system or brain functioning is proven erroneous by the plethora of organisms which exhibit clear signs of consciousness without having a brain or nervous system. Plants, bacteria, single cell, and many multicellular organisms all seem quite conscious without these. Are we to believe these life forms are insentient just because they don't have a brain or nerves? Irvin Laszlo wrote, While new technologies are enabling scientists to understand more and more of the mechanics of how mind is expressed through the brain, after many years of research, this still sheds no light on their central quest, one that we believe is fruitless because the premise on which it is based is wrong. We agree with transpersonal psychologist Stanislav Graf who for more than 50 years has studied human consciousness. Groff has compared the effort of trying to discover how mind arises from the brain to an engineer trying to understand the content of a television program solely by watching what components light up in the interior of the TV set. If someone sought to do such a thing, we'd laugh, yet this is the approach that mainstream science has taken, 
and insisted is correct, despite no evidence to support it, and a great deal that contradicts it. Stanislav Grof wrote, New scientific findings are beginning to support beliefs of cultures thousands of years old, showing that our individual psyches are, in the last analysis, a manifestation of cosmic consciousness and intelligence that flows through all of existence. We never completely lose contact with this cosmic consciousness because we are never fully separated from it. There are documented cases of hydrocephalus, otherwise known as water in the brain, where people have lived perfectly normal lives with almost no cerebral cortex or neocortex whatsoever. This is quite significant considering that classical science has always assumed the neocortex to be the supposed center of consciousness. British neurologist John Lorber recorded one case in which a young man's hydrocephalus was so extreme that his brain was virtually non-existent. Inside his skull was just a thin layer of brain cells surrounding a mass of cerebrospinal fluid. Amazingly, everything else about the young man was normal. He was even an honor student. If consciousness arises from brain functioning, how is this possible? Peter Russell wrote, The underlying assumption of the current meta-paradigm is that matter is insentient. The alternative is that the faculty of consciousness is a fundamental quality of nature. Consciousness does not arise from some particular arrangement of nerve cells or processes going on between them, or from any other physical features. It is always present. If the faculty of consciousness is always present, then the relationship between consciousness and nervous systems needs to be rethought. Rather than creating consciousness, nervous systems may be amplifiers of consciousness, increasing the richness and quality of experience. Peter Russell asks us to consider a couple simple thought experiments to prove to ourselves the non-locality of consciousness beyond space and time. When asked to locate their consciousness, most people sense it to be somewhere in their heads. Since our brains are in our heads, and the brain is often associated with consciousness, many people assume their consciousness is located in the middle of their heads, but actually, the apparent location of one's consciousness has nothing to do with the placement of one's brain, and rather depends on the placement of sense organs. Since your primary senses, eyes and ears, are in your head, the central point of your perception, the place from which you seem to be experiencing the world, is somewhere behind your eyes and between your ears, in your head. However, the fact that your brain is also in your head is merely coincidence, as shown by the following thought experiment. Imagine that your eyes and ears were somehow transplanted to your knees. So you now observe the world from this new vantage point. Now, if asked to locate your consciousness, where would you point? If your eyes and ears were on your knees, would you still experience your self to be in your head? Robert Anton Wilson wrote, I don't think consciousness is in the brain. The brain receives consciousness. Consciousness is probably a non-local function of the space-time continuum, and every individual brain is an individual receiver. Just like the world is full of television signals, and each television set is a receiver. The delusion that you are in your body is a primitive, savage kind of logic, taking the data of perception at face value. Similar to the delusion that Johnny Carson is inside your television set. Johnny Carson is not in your television set. Johnny Carson is in Hollywood. Your television set just receives Johnny Carson's signals, and consciousness is not in the brain. The brain just receives signals from the vast, undifferentiated ocean of consciousness that makes up the space-time continuum. Peter Russell wrote, The faculty of consciousness can be likened to the light from a video projector. The projector shines light onto a screen, modifying the light so as to produce any one of an infinity of images. These images are like the perceptions, sensations, dreams, memories, thoughts, and feelings that we experience, what I call the contents of consciousness. The light itself, without which no images would be possible, corresponds to the faculty of consciousness. We know all the images on the screen are composed of this light, but we are not usually aware of the light itself. Our attention is caught up in the images that appear and the stories they tell. In much the same way, we know we are consciousness, but we are usually aware only of the many different perceptions, thoughts, and feelings that appear in the mind. 
we are seldom aware of consciousness itself. In deep meditation, during spontaneous OBE, or under the effects of entheogens, many people temporarily transcend their contents of consciousness completely and achieve a lucid state of awareness that is purely the faculty of consciousness. In this state, there is no space and time, just the infinite here and now, no me and not me division, just one universal awareness. Such experiences are referred to as mystical and deemed unscientific because they are subjective and unrepeatable under laboratory conditions. But for those who experience such transcendental states, this first-hand gnosis provides them with an intuitive knowingness of the primacy of consciousness beyond all space, time, and matter. Fritz Joff Capra wrote, The Eastern mystics link the notions of both space and time to particular states of consciousness. Being able to go beyond the ordinary state through meditation, they have realized that the conventional notions of space and time are not the ultimate truth. The refined notions of space and time, resulting from their mystical experiences, appear to be in many ways similar to the notions of modern physics, as exemplified by the theory of relativity. Peter Russell wrote, In short, the impression that your consciousness is located in space is an illusion. Everything you experience is a construct within consciousness. Your sense of being a unique self is merely another construct of the mind. Quite naturally, you place this image of yourself at the center of your picture of the world, giving you the sense of being in the world. But the truth is just the opposite. It is all within you. You have no location in space. Space is in you. If a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, does it still make a sound? At first you might think, of course it still makes a sound, until further defining what sound actually means the sensation produced by stimulation of the organs of hearing by vibrations transmitted through the air or other medium. Dictionary.com When a tree falls, there are certainly pressure waves vibrating through the air, but since sound is a quality of consciousness, if no ears are around to hear those waves, then the tree literally does not make a sound. Peter Russell wrote, To the surprise of many, the world out there has turned out to be quite unlike our experience of it. Consider our experience of the color green. In the physical world, there is light of a certain frequency, but the light itself is not green, nor are the electrical impulses that are transmitted from the eye to the brain. No color exists there. The green we see is a quality appearing in the mind in response to this frequency of light. It exists only as a subjective experience in the mind. The same is true of sound. I hear the music of a violin, but the sound I hear is a quality appearing in the mind. There is no sound as such in the external world, just vibrating air molecules. The smell of a rose does not exist without an experiencing mind, just molecules of a certain shape. What we call colors or sounds or smells are all qualities created in consciousness, which have no independent existence without a sentient observer. Colors are just electromagnetic energy of a specific frequency, sounds are just vibrations of specific patterns, and smells are just various combinations of air molecules, all of which require the key element of consciousness to mystically transform these energetic emanations into our intricate and amazing everyday sensations. All our perceptions, sensations, dreams, thoughts, and feelings are forms appearing in consciousness. It doesn't always seem that way. When I see a tree, it seems as if I'm seeing the tree directly, but science tells us something completely different is happening. Light entering the eye triggers chemical reactions in the retina. These produce electrochemical impulses which travel along nerve fibers to the brain. The brain analyzes the data it receives, then creates its own picture of what is out there. I then have the experience of seeing a tree. But what I am actually experiencing is not the tree itself only the image that appears in the mind. This is true of everything I experience. Everything we know, perceive, and imagine, every color, sound, sensation, every thought and every feeling is a form appearing in the mind. It is all an informing of consciousness. Electromagnetic radiation with a wavelength between 380 and 760 nanometers, frequency of 790 to 400 terahertz, 
is detected by the human eye and perceived as visible light. Everything beyond that is invisible to us. All the colors of the rainbow and absolutely everything we see comes from just a narrow frequency on an infinite electromagnetic spectrum. Our highest perceivable frequency at 790 terahertz is the color violet. However, with the use of tools and technology, we know that above violet are ultraviolet light, x-rays, and gamma rays. Our lowest perceivable frequency at 400 terahertz is the color red. However, with the use of tools and technology, we know that below red are infrared, microwaves, and radio waves. The spectrum is infinite, yet we base our entire experience on the minute sliver perceivable to us and assume that is reality. Peter Russell wrote, Our eyes detect none of these other frequencies, and our image of reality represents but a tiny fraction of what is there. The same holds true of the other senses. What we hear, smell, and taste is but a limited sample of the physical reality. Furthermore, there are aspects of the physical world such as magnetic fields and electric charge that have very little, if any, impact on our experience. David Icke wrote, In the space that you are occupying now are all the radio and television frequencies broadcasting to your area. You can't see them, and they are not aware of each other because you and they are on different frequencies, or wavelengths. Only when the frequencies are really close do they experience interference. It is the same with our reality. Our physical world is just one of countless wavelengths, frequencies, or dimensions, and to experience and interact with this realm, we need an outer shell that is vibrating within this frequency range. Our consciousness is vibrating too fast to interact efficiently with this frequency. The body is the means through which our infinite awareness can directly experience this range of frequencies that I will call, to keep it simple, the five sense realm, world, or dimension. This is why the five senses of sight, touch, smell, hearing, and taste are so limited. They are confined to perceiving only this range of frequencies, this dimension. So in the universe there exists an infinite array of electromagnetic radiation, but only the tiniest glimpse of that array is available for sensory experience. Our physical bodies act like electromagnetic transistors for our awareness by switching on or off amplifying or muting the multitude of signals around us and funneling what we focus on. All visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, and gustatory sensations are brought to our consciousness through this frequency decoding process, just like tuning a radio, and in the grand scheme of things, we are barely receiving a signal. David Icke wrote, There is no solid world outside of you. All those people, streets, cars, and buildings only exist in that solid 3D state in your mind. Everywhere else they are frequency fields, thought fields, energy matrices, call them what you will. Television and the internet are perfect illustrations of what I'm talking about here. When we think of television, we think of pictures and programs, but the only place television exists in that form is on the TV screen. Everywhere else, television consists of frequency broadcasts and electrical circuitry. When we think of the internet, we think of websites, pictures, and graphics, but the only place the internet exists in that form is on your computer screen. Everywhere else, it consists of mathematical codes and electrical circuitry. To summarize, the physical world is a tiny frequency range or dimension within infinite awareness, the ocean. The body computer tunes us into this strictly limited sense of perception, this television channel, and acts as our vehicle to interact with this world. We have been manipulated into believing that we are the computer, and its mental, emotional, and physical software programs. This dimension, like all the others, is a mass of frequency fields that the body computer decodes into apparently 3D scenes, but in that form, they only exist in the brain or, more accurately, the energy matrix we call the brain. There is no physical world unless it is observed into form, decoded into form. The outside world around us has a convincing appearance of being out there somewhere, when in actuality the 3D world is no more out there than a dream. In dreams we perceive sights, sounds, and sensations, we have all our emotional and rational faculties, we encounter people, places, and situations, all seeming to be happening in a world out there, around us. 
not until we awaken do we realize that all those sights, sounds, sensations, people, places, and situations were simply creations of our minds, appearing around us, but coming from within us. Ken Wilbur wrote, Since the Greeks, philosophers have been thinking about the ghost in the machine, the small man within the small man, etc. Where is I, the person who uses his brain? Who is it that realizes the act of knowing? As St. Francis of Assisi said, What we search for is the one that sees. Peter Russell wrote, Today, after thirty years of investigation into the nature of consciousness, I have come to appreciate how big a problem consciousness is for contemporary science. Science has had remarkable success in explaining the structure and functioning of the material world, but when it comes to the inner world of the mind, to our thoughts, feelings, sensations, intuitions, and dreams, science has very little to say, and when it comes to consciousness itself, science falls curiously silent. There is nothing in physics, chemistry, biology, or any other science that can account for our having an interior world. How and why do we have an inner life at all? Professor of Philosophy at University of Arizona, Dr. David Chalmers, has coined this issue the hard problem of consciousness. How could any complex material process in the brain create our rich, immaterial, internal worlds of thought, emotion, sensation, and perception? Why is there a subjective aspect to reality at all? Peter Russell wrote, Nothing in Western science predicts that any living creature should be conscious. It is easier to explain how hydrogen evolved into other elements, how they combined to form molecules and then simple living cells, and how these evolved into complex beings such as ourselves, than it is to explain why we should ever have a single inner experience. Let's put the hard problem of consciousness through the process of elimination. We know from multiple experiments in quantum physics that quanta, the building blocks of matter, the fundamental units of stuff in the universe, do not become a set something with definite properties, location, and materiality without the key element of consciousness to collapse the wave function. In other words, no consciousness, no matter. So if consciousness is supposedly an emergent property of a Newtonian, Darwinian, mechanistic universe, what used to collapse the wave function in the days before the evolution of consciousness? Dean Radin wrote, since a key component in the quantum measurement process includes an observer and his or her knowledge, this means the mind is inextricably wound into quantum reality. Based on the classical assumptions of local realism and mechanism, the brain, like any other physical object, is a clockwork object. Since clockworks are not conscious, then what we call I can only be an emergent property of a complicated piece of machinery. And thus our sense of conscious awareness or the feeling one has when smelling a rose, are illusions, though illusions to whom is not quite clear. From a classical physics point of view, the you that is currently reading this sentence is an illusion. This seems to be a rather important limitation, as most people reading these sentences probably believe that they, their conscious minds, do exist. We often falsely assume that we are our physical bodies, because our consciousness seems trapped inside. We feel pain and pleasure, all emotions, perceptions, and sensations through the body, and so we identify with it. But is the body who and what we really are? If your leg gets cut off, is the leg still you? Or was the leg just a tool, a vehicle you use to experience the physical realm? Eric Pepin wrote, We are energy beings residing in bodies so that we can experience this physical dimension. The relationship between our energy being and our physical body is kind of like a person driving a car. Except, imagine that the person driving believes the car is their true being. It might strike you as funny to imagine a person who believes that they are the car, but that is the way most of us think of ourselves. We do not separate our physical bodies from the pure energy being that controls the body. When people drive cars, they do not become car beings. We are the energy beings within our bodies. Anyone who has experienced an OBE, NDE, or taken DMT will tell you emphatically that we are not our physical bodies. Indigenous peoples and shamanic cultures regularly practiced meditation, dream time, trance-inducing chants, 
dances, fasts, and ingested psychedelic entheogens, all of which put them directly in touch with non-physical aspects of their consciousness. Even the staunchest materialists are compelled beyond their will every night to relax their bodies to sleep while their consciousness travels to various dream worlds and dimensions beyond the physical. The signs are all around us, but the point is easy to miss. The physical world is simply a recurring dream that we awaken from when our bodies die. David Icke wrote, So the first revelation on the road to freedom, your body is not you. It is a fantastic biological computer that you are using to experience this reality. It is a vehicle, a means, not a you or an I. The spacesuit is the means by which an astronaut can experience other worlds. So is your body. We are not our bodies. We are infinite consciousness, and all that is. A seamless energy field within which all worlds and no worlds exist. The only difference between everything is the level of awareness that we are all that is. The deeper this awareness, the more you will access that level of knowing and perception. The more you think you are an individual and apart from everything else, the more you will disconnect from the infinite one that you really are. Still unconvinced that you are not your body? Did you know that every five to seven years, every single cell in your body dies and is replaced? Your entire body, every cell in your brain, Every cell in your eye, absolutely everything that composes your physical body, has died and been replaced multiple times. Meanwhile, your unique essence, your feeling of I amness, your consciousness, has remained exactly the same as when you were a child. Alan Watts wrote, This feeling of being lonely and very temporary visitors in the universe is in flat contradiction to everything known about man and all other living organisms in the sciences. We do not come into this world, we come out of it, as leaves from a tree. As the ocean waves, the universe peoples. Every individual is an expression of the whole realm of nature, a unique action of the total universe. This fact is rarely, if ever, experienced by most individuals. Even those who know it to be true, in theory, do not sense or feel it but continue to be aware of themselves as isolated egos inside bags of skin. But the cat has already been let out of the bag. The inside information is that yourself as just little me, who came into this world and lives temporarily in a bag of skin, is a hoax and a fake. The fact is that because no one thing or feature of this universe is separable from the whole, the only real you, or self, is the whole. The rest of this book will attempt to make this so clear that you will not only understand the words, but feel the fact. Synchronicity is a term coined by Swiss psychologist Carl Jung, which he defined as the temporally coincident occurrence of acausal events. In other words, synchronicities are meaningful coincidences. Highly improbable, highly significant, serendipitous happenings. When it is clear that there is no cause-and-effect connection between two events, yet a meaningful relationship nevertheless exists, this is synchronicity. Jung believed synchronicity is an acausal connecting principle of our collective unconscious, through which we are shown mystical glimpses of meaningful connections between our subjective and objective worlds, divine bridges between our inner and outer experiences. Paul Levi wrote, Synchronicities are revelations of the absence of any division between the physical world and the inner psychological reality. Synchronistic events are lucidity stimulators, neon signs from the dreamlike nature of the universe to help us wake up to its and our dreamlike nature. Just like a dream, mind and matter are not separate, distinct realities, but rather are seemingly different fundamental components of the same deeper, underlying reality that has both an external matter aspect and an internal mind aspect. Stanislav Grof wrote, The blurring of boundaries between consciousness and matter challenges everything we are taught in traditional Western thinking. From a very early age, we are urged by our parents, teachers, and religious leaders to draw clear lines between the subjective and the objective, the real and the unreal, the existent and the non-existent, or the tangible and the intangible. However, a reality that is very similar to Jung's acausal universe is becoming recognized in modern science. 
notably in quantum relativistic physics, it was Young's recognition of phenomena that exist outside of cause and effect that led him to define synchronicity as an a-causal connecting principle. Meaningful coincidences between the inner world, the world of visions and dreams, and the outer world of objective reality suggested to Young that the two worlds were not as clearly separated as we might think. Have you ever experienced visions or emotional pangs related to some person or incident outside your sensory experience? Have you ever had deja vu or coincidences so meaningful yet improbable that it boggled your mind? Have you ever had a friend or relative pop into your head and then seconds later the phone rings and it is them? Myself and many others have experienced such synchronicities, all of which can only be seen as chance or coincidence in a Newtonian world, but have special meaning in a Jungian, consciousness-based world. Greg Braden wrote, How many times have you gone to call someone on the phone and found that he or she was already on the line when you picked up the receiver? Or when you dialed the number, you discovered that the line was busy because your pal was calling you? On how many occasions have you found yourself enjoying time with friends in a busy street, mall, or airport, only to have the eerie feeling that you've already been in that place or with those people before, doing exactly what you're doing at that moment? While these simple examples are fun to talk about, they're more than random coincidences. Although we may not be able to prove scientifically why these things happen, we all know that they do. In such moments of connectedness and deja vu, we find ourselves spontaneously transcending the limits imposed by physical laws. In those brief instances, we're reminded that there's probably more to the universe and us than we may consciously acknowledge. I've personally experienced many synchronicities, deja vus, and prophetic dreams, which have convinced me that something like Jung's a-causal connecting principle truly does exist within consciousness, outside of space and time. For instance, one night in college, I actually dreamed of a conversation that I would be having the next day, and experienced paradigm-shattering deja vu as I found myself enacting my dream in reality. Stunned in revelatory paralysis, the dream came flooding back to me, and I realized that I was standing in the exact place, wearing the exact clothes, and having the exact discussion that I had dreamt. Suddenly, it occurred to me that I knew exactly the entire next sentence my friend was about to speak. So I quickly snapped out of the reverie and said the whole sentence along with her verbatim simultaneously. My friend then stared at me dumbfounded as I laughed and tried to explain. Another time, a few years ago, I was meditating and started to feel a tight clenching at my solar plexus, so I tried to relax, took a deep breath, and exhaled with an ohm. The very second I finished my ohm breath, the electricity in my third-floor apartment room, all the lights, and my digital clock went dark for two seconds, then came back on. Shocked, I phoned my friends on the second and fifth floors to see if their power had gone out, and it hadn't. This meant at most the power went out only on my floor, and perhaps only in my room. Perplexed and curious, I then said a little prayer to God, my higher self, or whatever aspect of the one consciousness was listening, and said, it seems like that was more than just a coincidence, and if that was some kind of sign, could I please have another one? And so the next day, I was downstairs in my girlfriend's room watching the cartoon South Park on DVD, the episode where Caesar Milan comes to deal with Cartman. Just as Caesar finished saying the words, you must express the dominant energy, the lights, the television, and everything went dark once again, then came back on two seconds later, and the DVD somehow skipped back and said once again, express the dominant energy. Express the dominant energy, coinciding with two power outages, my meditation and my asking for a sign, was quite an odd, memorable, and mysterious synchronicity for me. Stanislav Grof wrote, Most of us have encountered strange coincidences that defy ordinary explanation. The Austrian biologist Paul Kammerer one of the first to be interested in the scientific implications of this phenomenon, reported a situation where his train ticket bore the same number as the theater ticket that he had bought immediately afterward. Later that evening, the same sequence of digits was given to him as a telephone number. 
the astronomer Flammarion cited an amusing story of a triple coincidence involving a certain Mr. Deschamps and a special kind of plum pudding. As a boy, Deschamps was given a piece of this pudding by a Mr. de Fort Gabou. Ten years later, he saw the same pudding on the menu of a Paris restaurant and asked the waiter for a serving. However, it turned out that the last piece of the pudding was already ordered by Mr. de Fort Gabou, who just happened to be in the restaurant at that moment. Many years later, Mr. Deschamps was invited to a party where this pudding was to be served as a special rarity. While he was eating it, he remarked that the only thing lacking was Mr. Fortgibu. At that moment, the door opened and an old man walked in. It was Mr. Fortgibu, who burst in on the party by mistake because he had been given a wrong address for the place he was supposed to go. Michael Talbot wrote, Jung was treating a woman whose staunchly rational approach to life made it difficult for her to benefit from therapy. After a number of frustrating sessions, the woman told Jung about a dream involving a scarab beetle. Jung knew that in Egyptian mythology, the scarab represented rebirth, and wondered if the woman's unconscious mind was symbolically announcing that she was about to undergo some kind of psychological rebirth. He was just about to tell her this when something tapped on the window, and he looked up to see a gold-green scarab on the other side of the glass. It was the only time a scarab beetle had ever appeared at Jung's window. He opened the window and allowed the scarab to fly into the room as he presented his interpretation of the dream. The woman was so stunned that she tempered her excessive rationality, and from that point on, her response to therapy improved. These kinds of anecdotes are not exactly scientific, but due to the very nature of synchronicities, science and the scientific method are unfortunately ill-equipped to offer any insight into such intangible, immeasurable, and subjective phenomena. However, for many people who have personally experienced such highly improbable, unbelievable synchronicities, confirmation from science is unnecessary, because like a glimpse behind the veil, they are given a kind of gnosis, an intuitive recognition of the subtle interplays between consciousness, space, time, and matter. Stanislav Grof wrote, in a mechanical universe where everything is linked by cause and effect, there is no place for meaningful coincidences in the Jungian sense. In the practice of traditional psychiatry, when a person perceives meaningful coincidences, he or she is, at best, diagnosed as projecting special meaning into purely accidental events. At worst, he or she is diagnosed as suffering from hallucinations or delusions. Traditional psychiatrists either do not know about the existence of true synchronicities, or they prefer to ignore the concept. As a result, they may wrongly diagnose meaningful coincidences as the result of serious pathology, delusions of reference. In many cases of spiritual emergencies, where valid synchronicities were reported, people have all too often been hospitalized unnecessarily. Had those experiences been correctly understood and treated as manifestations of psycho-spiritual crisis, those same people might have been quickly helped through approaches supporting spiritual emergence, rather than undergoing all the problems that unnecessary hospitalization entails. Physicist F. David Peet believes synchronicities are very real phenomena which provide circumstantial evidence for an absence of division between the outside physical world and our inner psychological worlds. He states that the self lives on but as one aspect of the more subtle movement that involves the order of the whole of consciousness. It has been an arduous process, but as explored in the first chapter, quantum physics is slowly dragging the world of rational science, kicking and screaming to the realization that staunch materialism is untenable, and concepts like Jung's collective unconscious are not so fantastic or fanciful after all. Stanislav Grof wrote, Jung himself was fully aware of the fact that the concept of synchronicity was incompatible with the traditional science, and he followed with great interest the revolutionary new worldview that was emerging from developments in modern physics. He maintained a friendship with Wolfgang Pauli, one of the founders of quantum physics, and the two of them had a very fruitful exchange of ideas. Similarly, in personal communications between Jung and Albert Einstein, the latter explicitly encouraged him to pursue the concept of synchronicity because it was fully compatible with the new thinking in physics. Sadly, however, 
mainstream psychologists and psychiatrists have still not caught up with the revolutionary developments in modern physics and Jungian psychology.